Hello everybody, Ernie Costa here. Uh, today and over the next couple of videos, we're going to be talking about designing uh, from scratch a full-blown Azure Stack HCI deployment. This is going to be a little bit more technical um, than previous videos. Um, I'm going to be maybe wearing an obnoxious headset because of audio issues. I'm in a new room. It may look a little different. It may sound a little different. I need a haircut too, so I may look a little different. But we are going to be um, spending the next couple of videos just kind of talking, whiteboarding, and hopefully eventually uh, actually deploying Azure Stack HCI to your environment, um, or at least uh, something a little bit more than just watching a video of someone click through Windows Admin Center and uh, watching, you know, modals and pop-ups give you green check marks and thumbs up saying you did it. You know, there's there's nuance and difficulties that people have when it, when it comes to doing this stuff, and we wanted to spend a little bit more time architecting the solution from day zero. I would even say like day negative 50 uh, because there, there, are, there are things that folks need to be aware of when they do this kind of stuff. So Windows Admin Center is the uh, preferred and prescribed way by Microsoft to, to deploy Azure Stack HCI. And it's great, it works, it's fine. Um, there are Limitations and issues, though, with Windows Admin Center, and even Microsoft will tell you that um, they're 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 constantly iterating and improving WAC so that it um, it, it evolves with customer feedback. Um, remember, there are more than just one way to deploy and and integrate a hypervisor esque solution like Azure Stack HCI. Maybe you're just literally a brand new shop. Um, that's looking for a solution. Maybe you already have a current uh, Hyper-V solution in place that you want this to run side by side. Maybe you have VMware or Hyper-V and you're looking to migrate over to Windows Ad, uh, to uh, Azure Stack HCI and you want to just go scorched earth and start again from scratch because you want to figure out your networking better. You want to figure out your security posture better, uh, adopt some best practices. So all those th combinations of factors come into play here. And, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. I'm going to spend some time just drawing things out, whiteboarding things um, so that we can help you plan your workload uh, or, or size your, your HCI deployment for your workload uh, and not just for day day one, but also uh, your your future scale. So we're going to get right into it. I'm going to start off with some uh, basic diagrams to explain some terminology, and, uh, and, and we're going to go from there. Okay, so we're going to talk about planning your deployment and, and what that looks like. And if you're already speaking to a, uh, a certified partner with Microsoft that, that deals with integrated systems for Azure Stack HCI, they're going to be your number one resource to actually picking and choosing the right hardware. But generally speaking, uh, Microsoft advertises six different type of deployment scenarios. Off the top of my head, you know, your general VM workloads, uh, your uh, SQL Server deployments, uh, VDI-esque deployments, maybe they're running Azure Virtual Desktop or just home home run or RDS scenarios. Um, Azure Kubernetes Service, uh, AKS on HCI, that's, a, that's another big one that, that's being uh, touted. And then there's some like machine learning and GPU heavy workloads that, that you can also do. And I don't know if I hit all of them. I might've hit like five out of six, but um, the point is the the hardware vendors are going to be able to come up with a solution that matches specifically what you're looking for. My personal experience, I, I'm, I'm, I'm big VM heavy guy. Um, I've been using Hyper-V since it first came out. I have some experience with VMware, but Hyper-V is my, my forte. Um, so the majority of the workloads I run are virtualized workloads. Um, with that in mind, when you talk about VM workloads, um, you it's 2022. I, I like to lead off with that. Your storage is going to be probably your biggest concern when it comes to Azure Stack HCI in terms of performance. Yes, CPUs are a concern. Yes, available memory is a concern. NUMA configurations, all that happy stuff. 
but generally speaking, your storage subsystem is going to be your biggest limiting factor with a lot of things. Um, if you saturate your your C, if you saturate your uh, storage backplane, let's say you have a bunch of NVMe in there, and you find a way to like no, like outperform that, then yeah, then you can start worrying about your CPU and stuff like that. But but generally speaking, your your storage is the is the primary concern. So when I talk to folks about VM workloads and storage. Um, I just tell them it's 2022, the year's 2022. It's, the cost of flash is significantly cheaper than it was five, 10 years ago. Yes, there's supply chain issues, but generally speaking, flash is cheap. Just go with it. You, you get the cool benefits of ReFS deduplication with Azure Stack HCI. ReFS deduplication works really, really well with NVMe, with low latency storage. Why wouldn't you do this? You, you, Trust me, you're gonna you're gonna see a, a huge cost savings with dedupe, um, even on your production workloads. Go with off flash. All right. So what I mean by that, uh, in terms of um, not cheaping out on disk, if you're in the procurement process and you're specking some workload out, and let's say you have a, a bunch of servers that have uh, 24 bays available, 24 drive slots available. Um, it may make sense to max out your servers with as many smaller drives as possible, but fill those bays up so that you can um, expand your performance. So NVMe, obviously those disks can approach anywhere from like 50,000 to 100,000 IOPS. They, they keep getting better and better, especially with PCIe 4. Um, so if you had 24 bays, it would make sense to have 24 NVMe per node, right? I mean, 24, disks running at uh, 50,000 IOPS and then stretched out across however many nodes you have in your cluster, that's going to be, it's going to haul, haul ass. It's going to move. And that's, that's really, um, that, that makes sense. But you paint yourself into a corner there by if you needed more storage down the road, you can't just add storage to these clusters anymore. Um, you will need literally, you, your only choice is to add additional nodes with then presumably to keep your drive symmetry the same, another 24. That would be helpful if I did that in the right color. Another 24 NVMe. And that's not a cheap, um, that's not a cheap answer. Like you're basically paying the same amount as your original CapEx for that hardware spend. And maybe that, maybe that is the only solution for, for your workload. Maybe you literally need like a gazillion million IOPS from day one. Again, though, in the reality of the situation is most people who are running VM workloads can get away with um, cutting down on the number of drives from day one, getting bigger drives, and then scaling from there so that you don't need to pay for the chassis, the RAM, the CPU, yada, yada. That is good because you don't need to pay for a dip. Well, yeah, if you're running VM workloads and they're Windows workloads, you probably are going to be paying for a Windows server, uh, probably a Windows server data center license to, to license those VM workloads unless you're running like Linux or something, but generally speaking, the, the, the CapEx is the big killer here. So keep that in mind, just, so, just something to be aware of, that future scale is very, very important. Uh, plan ahead, don't paint yourself into a corner. That's the way I'm gonna, that's the way I'm gonna phrase it. Um, the, next, the next couple minutes I'm gonna spend on is, is a combination of multiple networking things I wanna talk about. Um, and I don't necessarily mean like, um, you know, RDMA versus iWarp or, or going like, like direct attached cable twin ax versus fiber optic cable. I mean, your, your, the way you are managing this cluster. Um, I, I've seen way too many times where people have, let's say their production domain and network. So we'll just call it like prod.corp.com, right? And this is where like, Ecosta and my password lives. Like I'm an AD user, I'm an on-prem AD user, uh, and this is where your users' credentials are. And hopefully you have um, what we call tier one accounts or your accounts that your elevated privileges exist in. So like Ecosta is my regular user. And let's just say I have a, a Ecosta uh, domain admin, and that's my DA account. And however you set that up, the point is your separation of uh, your your daily driver compared to your um, 
your Corvette, <laughs> your the account that you should actually um, be doing administrative tasks in, maybe hopefully through some kind of just in time. The point is, even this type of segregation of 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 roles are back, if you will, for your traditional domain. I, I still don't think this is enough, and a lot of people are going to agree with you. So we're going to kind of zoom out here, and we're going to talk about the concept of a fabric domain or a management domain. And this is great if you're if you're doing if you don't have something like this, I recommend you you start you do this from scratch, you build it from scratch. Um, you can run this side by side for a while. You can poke some holes through firewalls. But the point is, let's say you have your uh, your HCI cluster, and we're going to draw it this way. So, you know, we have node one, node two, node three, node four, four node cluster. Uh, we're going to say that these are on a, uh, let's see if I can change colors here. We're going to have a network that's on a VLAN. We'll just call it like VLAN 200 and um, 172.20.0. Dot zero, let's just say it's slash 24, all right? And just for management purposes, so this isn't your SMB network, this isn't your storage stuff, this is just the management network. These nodes are gonna be, they're gonna have an IP address on this subnet tagged to this VLAN. And we're going to call this, we're gonna, we're gonna make a whole new domain here so that means you need another DC uh, with, you know, DNS. DHCP is probably not required. You can do that if you want, but you're gonna have some other device, hopefully a bare metal domain controller. Um, you can do virtualized domain controllers if you like, um, where that DC is also on this network. And let's just say it is running a network called, um, you know, fabric dot Corp.com, and you can even get crazier. You can even put this on a whole different domain. It could be, you know, fabric. Dot uh, company. Dot net, however you want, whatever you want to call it, but we'll just call it fabric.corp.com. Um, and if you're worried about access getting into this, this now separates your VM workloads that are running on these. Hyper-V servers, these HCI uh, cluster nodes, um, you would then have other trunked VLANs. So we'll draw that up here. So this is going to be your tenant VLANs. And I say VLANs, plural. So you have your prod, maybe that's on like VLAN 100, maybe it's on multiple VLANs, who knows. Um, maybe you have some uh, another uh, another domain for maybe your your marketing department and they're on VLAN uh, 300 so you can have all these tagged up here so you would have uh, 100 200 300 200 I mean eh, probably should exclude that because that's your management, but you could hyper-converge all this. But for simplicity's sake, you're, uh, you're, you would then have another virtual switch that the actual VMs that are running on these nodes can get their VNICs attached to and the appropriate VLAN ID tagged. So that allows you to separate your workloads from your actual hypervisor fabric, and it allows you now to start scaffolding out things like conditional access, uh, uh, lets you leverage things like pause, privileged access workstations. Uh, you can integrate MFA, and that's all doable by having this separate management network. So to build on this a little bit now, we can start getting kind of kind of creative here. Uh, we can have, let's say, some some kind of VM that is running remote desktop services that's on this uh, VLAN 200 network. And let's say, I probably should have drawn that with purple. And then let's say over here, we have, um, we have some kind of firewall appliance. Um, 
and that firewall appliance, uh, maybe it's running PFSense, maybe you use Checkpoint, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, what this can then be expanded to is if I'm on VLAN 100 as my daily driver, let's say eCosta is on VLAN 100, we can have firewall rules that allow stuff from VLAN 100 on port 3389 to connect to the stuff that's on VLAN 200 on port 3389 in, in VLAN 200. So, and you can tighten that down. You don't need to do entire subnets with your firewall. You can do specific IPs. I can do whatever this thing's IP is, can only connect to this thing's IP. And now I am RDP'd into this remote desktop session uh, host. Maybe there's multiple of them, who knows? Um, and from here, I can manage my domain controller, my Hyper-V nodes. So I am not directly manipulating these from my machine. I have literally a whole nother set of credentials that I need to use to log into this remote desktop services. Um, and, and that allows me to basically have this set of credentials compromised, maybe because I'm reusing my, my password there, or maybe uh, there was some kind of leak. Uh, or maybe some bad guy was able to get my, I don't know, dump LSAS on a production domain controller. You know, you have thousands of users on your production environment. This fabric, you really, 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 really want to limit to only a certain number of people who have access to it. So, I mean, you can even, you can get creative. You can, you can build automation to kind of synchronize accounts. If, you know, someone gets terminated here, they get terminated here. But the point is separation of church and state. Don't allow this account to ultimately be some kind of backdoor into your entire fabric. Because it's one thing if your VMs get corrupted or ransomware internal to the VM itself, but as soon as that lateral movement allows them to start owning the actual hypervisor infrastructure and they start like crypto locking your hypervisors, your mean time to recovery is going to be astronomically higher no matter what backup software you have no matter what 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 dr plans you have in place it's extra steps that now need to happen so if you can isolate that lateral movement that's what we're aiming for here so we are trying to build out a network where the tenant workload can't escape through the network to your management network think of it like like azure think of how azure or aws does it aws is probably a bad example but azure runs on Windows, like at the end of the day, it's Hyper-V. Those Hyper-V servers, whatever version of Windows Server they're running underneath it, it's probably a build very, very similar to Azure Stack HCI, but they're running Windows Server. And those machines are going to be joined to some kind of domain that Azure administrators, some guy or girl that's working in a data center for Microsoft is going to be managing that stuff. And that, um, they're not going to be using their normal Microsoft account for that. I guarantee you that. They're going to probably have a very, very strict limited credentials that, that are tightly coupled to that fabric management. So that's it for, for this one. We're going to, uh, we're going to, like I said, grow on these videos. Uh, we're going to add more, more topics. We're going to dive into things a little bit better. Uh, but that's just a quick little primer on how to prep your, your Azure Stack HCI deployment, whether it's fresh, whether it's, it's, a, it's an add-on or a bolt-on, maybe you're scaling, just, just some, just some uh, food to chew on. Thank you very much. Looking forward to talking to you the next time.